So I'm here today with Michael Chaplin and you have written this really masterful book called A Fallen God and you are also in the process of creating a film documentary about your father's life and his roots, his heritage mm. about the gypsies in England. Mm -hmm. And I meant to ask you something before we go into the book subject and then the documentary and your own life. One thing that has really stayed with me, because I saw it when I was a little kid, and by the way, we grew up in the same place, almost in Vevey, by the shores of yeah. the Lake Geneva, Lac Léman. But the thing that, that had remained in my mind, but it was recalled only when I knew that we would be talking together, was that scene where you speak as an 11-year-old with your father, Charlie Chaplin, in his movie, a King in New York, oh, yes. because it's on YouTube. You can um, you can watch the four minutes. By the way, they're on YouTube. And the eleven-year-old Michael Chaplin speaks back at his father about the state of the world. And anyway, what I meant to say, to make a long story short, was what you said then and what is going on now today, fifty some years later, and what is in your book, which is a historical thriller about. Mm -hmm. The 12th century and the Kassa time and the crusades of the Pope against the Kassas, etc. I felt, well, it's all the same. We're just always in this world of uh, thrillers and conflict. Can you talk and about power. this? Do you, do you still yeah. power? Yes, too much power, you said as a kid. Too much power. Yes, well, the, the, it's kind of ironical because the um, when I played that, that part, I, I suppose I was nine or ten years old. Ten years, yeah. Ten years. In 57. In 57, yes. So um, I was playing a very precocious child who yes. obviously read uh, bits of Karl Marx and, uh, and uh, which of course I hadn't and I was the, rather the opposite of a precocious child. I was <coughs> quite, um, quite behind really in, in, uh, in school and, and mm -hmm. So it was not at all within my nature to to um, so everything I said was was way beyond my understanding. I just learnt, learnt the lines, learnt the lines, mm -hmm. and, and uh, spouted them out as my father wanted me to do it. You know, he showed me he would do it himself, and I would just imitate him. And so you so remember this very well, still. I remember very well, yeah. But uh, the the politics I was I was talking, I, I understood nothing about it. But I think yes, it, it um, what what he says is is still as valid today as, as uh, you know even more so when he says uh, you can't go anywhere without a passport. Uh, well, it's getting worse. You know, it's getting harder. You need visas, and it's, and uh, there's more more control, more security. Yes, so and our so passports have chips in it now. They have yes, little chips and, and, uh, GPS is in mm. them. Um, Yes, we're speaking about this, the, the gypsies, they used to be able, I don't know how it's today, but they used to be able to cross borders without passports because I believe they used some sort of secret uh, networks and codes and well, you will know more because you're really researching now the, this whole gypsy world. Yes, well, I think gypsies, um, I'm, you know, that's, that's one thing I'm not really all that well informed about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've really been looking into um, gypsies in terms of their their art and their um, their music, their their music, yes, especially yes. And uh, because the, the the documentary I'm making is trying to establish where my father was born. Yes, because there's there's no. <laughs> There's no um, record of his birth. Yes. So even the date, is, you know, we just take it as. as uh, so the astrological <coughs> date of Charlie Chaplin is in question. Well, I but I've so, got yes, yours. We will talk so. about you soon. You know, there was an. In <coughs> the only thing is an announcement in a, yes. in a theatrical review. Oh yes. Where people who worked in in the music hall. Yes, yes, yes. Would make announcements <coughs> about where they were going, what work they were doing, mm -hmm. and there's an announcement about his birth from from his mother. 
in 1889. Yes. Yes. And maybe she gave them the, the, the date, 16th of April. 16th of April, yes. But we don't know where she was really around that time. Uh, his mother. Yes. Yes, yes. She wasn't with uh, his father. His father was working up north in England. Mm -hmm. She was in, in, in London, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But she may have been uh, traveling. And that's why. There is a rumor that he was born outside Birmingham in a caravan yes. on Black Patch, which was a huge gypsy. Yes, hence area. the title of your documentary is yes. Caravan's Trail. Yes. The Caravan's Trail. So we've been looking into his own, his own art yes. and uh, talking with gypsies, asking them if they see, you know, if there's anything typically gypsy in it. In and his work, you in mean? In his work. Yes. And this is very interesting because a lot of gypsies always thought he was a gypsy. Yes. Because of the because of the person, the tramp. He appears well, of from course, nowhere. Yes. Le, le Clochard, he has yes. no home. He has <laughs> no. Uh, he's pretty he obvious. Has no fixed uh, job, yes. or he's just uh, someone who even he enters into the films uh, from nowhere. Yes. And so this always was very easy to identify with for gypsies. And you say in your um, the the little trailer I saw that. He knew it, and, and you say in some other places, I heard you say that um, he told you when oh, you yes, were very no, little, he told us as, as he, children, but yes. he didn't maybe know the details, because <coughs> I want you to speak I about that letter that, that you found, yes, well, which that, that is absolutely that. thrilling, how he finds the letter that was addressed to his father. Yes, well, he, he, uh, <coughs> he used to tell us that, he'd say, you know, you have... Um, Gypsy blood, mm -hmm. uh, Romani. Romani, yeah, yeah, Romani, Romani. See, yes. You have Romani blood, um, and I think he was talking about his his um, his grandmother, mm -hmm. who he says she was half gypsy. Uh, Mary Ann Terry Hodges Smith. She had several names, which is typical for for, for gypsies because yes. they used to change their name wherever they went. Yes, and yes. So she had several names and several husbands, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think about four four children, uh, of which was his mother. And so he traced his gypsy heritage from there. But then um, David Robinson, who wrote a very thorough biography. Oh yes, this is the biography yes. of your father's. Yes, he researched into mm -hmm. his um, into the chaplains. Mm -hmm. And he found that his, um, my father's grandfather, was married to a woman. He found a marriage certificate, mm -hmm. and she's described on it as a Romany, a Romany Smith. Yes, yes, yes. So in fact, both his grandmothers were gypsy, but I don't think he knew about it on his father's side, because oh, okay. um, he didn't really know his father. His father was a. Uh, a very shadowy figure in his life. We met, I think, only once or twice. He was not, uh, yes. or in his memory, maybe as a very young child. Yes, maybe. yes. Because they were. Did he ever speak to you personally when you were a little guy, or is that now from your research no, via that's Robinson? That's from, from uh, our research. Okay, okay. And uh, but he says, in his autobiography, he says talking about um, his mother and his grandmother. And I think he's making a reference to his, uh, he says we were, the gypsy thing was always kept quiet. Mm -hmm. It was a skeleton in the cupboard. Yes. And then he goes on to say about his, uh, his family, I suppose, talking about his mother's side. He says, to judge our family, the morals of our family, by, um, by usual standards, would be like sticking a thermometer into boiling water. <laughs> <laughs> So that says a lot. This know, is from, well said. You, uh, can can you, you say the, the story quickly, sorry, about how you, um, about the letter, the famous letter? I found that yes. fascinating because I saw in the little trailer, because there is a, a, a very small presentation of Michael Chaplin's upcoming documentary, The Caravan's Trail. Yes. And there you speak about this letter. Maybe you can take it from there. Yes, well, the, the, the whole idea of the documentary originated with this letter. Yes. Because when my father died, 
my mother kept the house um, as it was, and then she she re redecorated it at some point. But his room was always kept just as it was. I see, she never yes. touched anything in mm -hmm. there, and and, uh, and so it was left that way. But then when my mother died. Um, we all inherited uh, the house and so yes. we divided uh, amongst, there were eight children yes. and uh, we divided the... You, you're his furniture. eldest son, by the way, right? You're the eldest I'm son. I'm his eldest son with my mother. Yes, of course. He had yes. two sons from the yes. former marriage who were much older yes. than me. And so then the, you split up, yes, you so shared so the belongings. We shared yes. all the belongings. Yes. So my sister, she chose a cupboard that was in his, in his room. Mm -hmm. That he had, uh, he kept his various things in it, clothes, but there was a, a, a drawer that was mm -hmm. locked. And so she couldn't open it, so she had to call the a locksmith because no one could find the key. And uh, he came and he opened it, and in the drawer there was a letter, mm -hmm. that's all. And the letter is from a man called Jack Smith. Uh, who read his autobiography when it came out in the 70s, it was published. Oh yeah, he the autobiography. He Robinson, read the yes. autobiography. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he wrote to him and said, I've just read your autobiography, Charlie, and you know you're a little liar. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were not born in Kennington. You were born uh, in the Gypsy Queen Centinia's caravan on Blackpatch. In Smithwick, mm -hmm. outside Birmingham, mm -hmm. and he goes on to say that he was also born um, in that very same caravan, and that he remembers his mother talking to Charlie's mother about oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. his birth when he was a child mm -hmm. in the caravan. He pretended to be asleep one night, and she was talking about the birth oh, of, of the, Charlie. The kid who wrote then the letter to that. Yes. yes, I follow. Okay. Who was who was uh, an old man in the seventies? Yeah, yeah. He, he was. Uh, and so he remembers his mother talking about his birth in that, in that to your grandmother. Yeah. 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 And he said, "You know, I could tell you, I could tell you thing, I could tell you things you've always been asking yourself all your life. Um, mm -hmm. Who you really are? Because that was his big question: Who am yes, I? Yes. Yeah. This is like and Krishnamurti esque. Yes, <laughs> who, exactly. am I? who am I? So he, he, so he begins to answer to your father in his letter. He doesn't answer. He, he just oh, he says, does not yet answer. Okay. He says, you know, I'm not trying to blackmail you. I don't want money. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 uh, I'm an honest man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he was leaving it open for my father, obviously, to, to follow up. Kick and follow up. Yes. Now, I don't know if my father did, because he never spoke about that letter. Oh, of course. I don't know if he spoke about it to my mother. But he received a lot of fan mail, and um, he. Uh, Do you know when that was? He would give letter? it to his secretaries to file away. Oh yes, yes. But that one letter, he put in a drawer and locked it. Yes, up. of course he didn't. Want. Which means yes, it had some resonance to him. Well, of course it went to uh, the heart it of the man. Seemed to answer a question for him. Yes. So. Do, do you uh, remember when that letter was written? That was written in the in the seventies. I don't know the exact date. Just yet. after the autobiography yes, after the was published. Yes. yes, of course. And so this is where your documentary this begins. Is, That's this is where it begins. Yeah. And it's in in we haven't uh, finished it. Yes. We've been filming on Black Patch. We've been filming. Oh, you're going on the locations. You're literally location. going on the trail. Yes. Of your dad's to past. Descendants of people who, whose, uh, whose uh, ancestors yeah, lived, on still Black, remember, yes, yes. lived on Black. Yes, yes, yes. And because uh, they then, when they were all moved out of that site, a lot of them just lived in houses around Black Patch because they didn't want to leave the area. Yes, it had a very strong meaning for them. So oh, they're of still course, the energy children energy. of those yes. those uh, people who were moved out and grandchildren mm -hmm. who are alive today and they all meet up on the 21st of July in a pub that's, that's on the edge of Black Patch okay. and uh, have, a, have a party. Yes, yes. So we were up this July filming the party and talking to a lot of the people. Oh, just this past summer of 2013 yes. you've been there, yes. 
And, and so what have you found out? Do you have anything new? I mean, this is a big project that is ongoing. You don't project. know yet when you're going to release the documentary. That's still open-ended, yes? Well, we have um, the, the festival in Bologna mm -hmm. in next July, would like us to... In 2014, Yes, to, July. Show, to show something. Even you would like to show something. They would like to see, you know, something. Like and so what have you found out while you met them at that party? Did you... Well, were you were able to say a little more? The rumor of him being born there mm -hmm. existed before, before the letter was known, known about. Um, okay, that's important. Yes. So it was also, the rumors were there, in other words, before he himself was world famous? Well, but certainly was, before was, the letter a, is it, written. Yes, because yes. the letter was published, uh, published by, I talked about the letter about, um, well, now over a year ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it, and um, it interested a man who was doing the BBC radio show, and he um, he had it on his show. He talked about it, and then there was an article in the Sunday Times. Oh, I see. Okay, so and, this is uh, known already to a lot of people. Yeah, so. Yes, and then shortly after that, the British uh, Secret Service files, MI five files. Oh, of course, they always were published. Right after. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after 50 years, they have to put their yes, 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 of scrutiny. Course. And that happened shortly after we talked about it. <clears throat> and because they it, were interested in your father's activities, right? Yes, or they, even they asked when he, who when he, he was. And when all. he couldn't return to America. Yes, yes, and yes. They contacted uh, MI5, the, the, I don't know if it was the FBI or the CIA, because the mm. FBI was after him too. Uh, um, yes. Um, what's his name? The, the great... Uh, McCarthy? You mean? Or? No, um, I'm the, the director of the FBI, mm -hmm. the famous one. Uh, oh, the crazy um, Hoover? Who? Is that right? That's it, yes. Edgar, Edgar Hoover, yeah. Edgar, Edgar Hoover. Yeah. That, by the way, that's a fascinating story to come into this aspect because at that point you are about, what, eight, nine years old? Do you remember some of this still? Because you were born in Santa Monica, right? In California. Santa Monica. And so your first few years. So I was six years old. Uh, in California, yeah. and, and at age six comes the big move where he says, "Okay, because enough. my father was being harassed by the FBI." Yeah, yeah. They were really at, Edgar Hoover was after him. It was, it was a kind of an obsession. There was that bad. He was obsessed yeah. by that. Yeah. So he decided he would go away for maybe three, four months oh. and, and tour Europe. Yes, just yes, yes. to get the pressure off his back. And yes. Maybe he things might calm down. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he was on the boat. To cross over and, and to England. Yes. Um, he received a telegram that he would not be allowed back into England, <laughs> to America. Wow. That his, uh, his, his uh, visa well, was finished. <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not laughable, but yeah, well, horrible. Things, things haven't changed. But oh, because he, he had still British citizenship he, then, right? He never, he never wanted to give up his British citizenship. Yes, citizenship. Yeah, I understand. Why, I don't know, but... Uh, he, he, I think that your father was um, beyond psychic. I, I really think he had a very precise knowing, foreknowing of events. That's my own feeling about it. I think he, he kind of knew when to be in the right spot. He, was a, he, he acted on his instincts. That's what I mean, yeah. So, so then he, he came to Switzerland and he set up yes. his home in Vevey, yeah? Yes. And but so that, at that time you were about six, seven years old? Se yeah, six, seven years old when we moved into our house in, in, in Switzerland. Cause yes. We were looking around Europe. But and so they had he told him he was not allowed back in the US. They just revoked his visa, which yeah. was of course terrible for his whole work, for the business. I mean, he yeah. had still United Artists. Yeah, of yeah, which he was know, the founder. I had to send my mother back, who, who, um, who is still a, an American citizen. Because her father is uh, O'Neill, right? O'Neill, the, yes. the famous, yes. So she went back and, you know, got, and his, she got, up. His, got his money out, which she was obviously very worried about. And, and, uh, That's an adventure. And closed yes. all his... Uh, but you stayed in Switzerland then? Did yes, you go back but we were staying in England for about six months. And then, oh, okay. Then we <clears> moved <throat> to Switzerland and mm -hmm. settled there. Did he explain to you then what was actually going on, or do you remember? No, he didn't. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. We were just children, and uh, and didn't you went to school in Switzerland afterwards? Or afterwards, what? we went into school in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. But really, well, to go back to the 
gypsy thing and not knowing where he was born, what happened was shortly after that letter was was uh, made known. Yes. The secret service files, the uh, MI5, were opened up to, to public scrutiny. Yes. And they found out that um, the FBI had asked, uh, or the CIA had asked uh, MI5 to keep an eye on, on uh, my father mm -hmm. to see if he had any commun if he was going to make any contacts with communists in Europe. Ah, yes, because they were trying to build a case against Yes, they were trying to build a case against <sighs> him and... Has anything many, changed many in this people? world today? <laughs> and we're now, what, um, 50, 60 years later soon? And yeah. It's not called communist, now it's called terrorist, but whatever, anyway, I should keep my comments to myself. <laughs> no, no, but, but then you, and you so then, so the as a kid... they found, they couldn't yes? find any, any links to, to, um, to any links to communism or to... Uh, yeah, of course, it's absurd. But what they did find is they didn't... that there was no evidence of him having been born in, in Great Britain. Ah, oh, that's where their mystery begins. They don't even find a trace of Charlie yes. Chaplin. <laughs> so... I can imagine so, this is too um, fun. And they went... they looked into France. Yes, yes, yes. Because um, they literally did not know where or when this human being pops out into exactly. this world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I find this amazing. A bit like the character he, he, he created. Yes, yes. So that, that's that's very that's very interesting. So really, we are we are uh, making a film about that. This is absolutely. I mean, this is like a thriller. You're going back into the past of your mm. father, and this mm. is amazing. So um, maybe we can take it from there now, from your own life. And we'll talk about the book as well. So at that point, you were then working with your father. I mean, you appear in his movie, A King in New York, and I believe also in another one. But at times, he would bring you in and yeah, he would work with your dad. Yes, yes. In Limelight, I was just uh, an extra. You know, yes. Had no and then after that, to come forward now to your life today, so you went to school in Switzerland and then you studied there. And, and then you went to England, right? I think if you can take us <coughs> quickly through your own life, because now this I went is about to school you. in Switzerland mm -hmm. uh, as a very, very poor student. Um, didn't do well in school. I had tremendous conflict with my father because he, having not had a, a formal education, because mm -hmm. he, he worked when he was a little kid and he was in the streets. And yes, and yes. That. So he. Coming from his background, he thought education was the one weapon you, you, you could have against uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. I understand, and, uh, from his viewpoint, in yeah, that sense. Yeah, for a lot of people of that yes. generation, yes, really, that's, education that's really right. was the one, and for him it mattered a lot. But you, and as a Pisces, you intuitive, you didn't need education. <laughs> that's kind well, of funny. I'm, I'm sure I needed it, but I, I just couldn't absorb it. You know, well, you could probably you uh, felt I that couldn't it was concentrate in class. I couldn't sit on a bench and, and listen to a teacher for more than three, four minutes without dream looking out the window and, and thinking of something else. That's what sounds like so, a Pisces. So but none, <laughs> of it, none of it actually penetrated or yes. And uh, that's maybe so good. So you were not programmed. <laughs> not programmed that way. And then you went to England. So at sixteen, I. Uh, I was too much in conflict with, with uh, my father and, and I just oh, left I see. home. Oh, you just left, took yes. off. So I went to England and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, tried to make a life over there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, got a few little jobs and stayed mm -hmm. with a, a very kind lady who took me in. And, and uh, I was in love with her daughter at the time. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I spent, uh, and that, from there on, I spent about. 12 years in London. Ah, oh, okay. So, I was there, I went, I suppose I went there in 62, maybe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, London was a very, very conservative, um, rather boring place, I suppose. Yes. Not, not much to do mm -hmm. when, when I arrived there. Early 60s. Early yeah. 60s. It was in the middle of the Cold War and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, but then things changed, the Beatles and everything all of a sudden. there was this incredible yes. explosion that, that happened. And you were like right in the middle of it, right? You, you got to know people. Maybe you can take us further now. 
of what you well, did and how I will, it I was, developed? I was, I was uh, yeah, I was in it. Mm -hmm. You know, just as a, as a, some as so many others, yes. um, taken up by this uh, idea that. Uh, um, well, then of course, it was not only the Beatles, but it, it really came from America, from San Francisco, from uh, the, the whole hippie yes. movement. Yeah, of course, trickled whole, into yes. London at that point. And, and, uh, Is it at that point that you? You mentioned you did meet Krishnamurti, or you attended a talk. Was that in England? No. Or no, that's no, later. That was in Switzerland, in Salon. Ah, in Salon, you met yes. him. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't meet him. I, I, I I'd read, um, i read some of his his, his books. Yes, yes. I was very interested at one point um, in in uh, Zen Buddhism. Yes. Read Suzuki's works, essays in Zen Buddhism. Ah, okay. So. D yeah. During that time, that whole hippie, etc. time yes, you're talking about, yeah. you, you went into this. Right? I went this into is, this like yes. a lot of other people. Yeah, I did that. I smoked <laughs> a lot of marijuana. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I like the title. Can you say that again? The, the book that you did as a very young man, I could not. I smoke. couldn't smoke the grass in my father's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Some more. Oh no, here it is. Sorry. Hold on a second. Is it on already? Oh, Buddhism, Suzuki, and then you, you went to a talk of Krishnamurti's, I suppose, at Sun. Yes, and, and but this, was, this was, uh, you know, this was quite a while later. Oh, that's later, I, I, not I, in the I, 60s. I, it's uh, no, it was in, I suppose it would have been in 1978, just after my father died. He died on, on Christmas 1977. Yes. And so I, I was, remember that, that that was a big thing in Switzerland. Yes, yes. I was so then just um, graduating, and that I remember that day when your dad died. That was like yeah, a lot of journalists in, in Bave. <laughs> and uh, I was in Switzerland at that moment with my mother, so mm -hmm. my, with uh, with my wife, and we we. Uh, we stayed in Switzerland to kind of help her, yes, help yes, her yes. out because she was obviously quite a, she, she's someone who had li lived her whole life sheltered in, in my father's world mm -hmm. and uh, she was a bit, when, when he died, she was a bit in, in, suddenly in a great void yes. and uh, so we, we were there at that time and stayed at the, in, in Switzerland. But the reason I'm bringing Krishnamurti yes, up is well then, because I think your father I'd knew read, him. I'd read, uh, yes, yes, funnily enough. Because um, I studied, <coughs> I've never met him, but I studied his books for 10 years for my own work. And, and somehow I know that your father and Krishnamurti were almost maybe friends even. I'm not sure, but they knew. No, he, no? he Krishnamurti in, in, a, in a book mm -hmm. uh, has a recollection of meeting my father, okay. <clears throat> they all went uh, through a, a, through mutual friends. Yes, yes. They, they, he was he was a young man then. This this is when he first went to California, I think. Say again. That I think Krishnamurti was was uh, it was when he would first went to America. I don't know when when exactly oh, okay. that was. Oh, I uh, can't remember by heart, but. Um, well, it was probably after he told the uh, the Ozophists to get lost, but I would say it was in the More late twenties, yeah. so, early thirties. Yeah, it was in the twenties. So both your father and he would have been in their forties, um, early forties, maybe. Yeah. Around that time. Yeah. Yes. It was in the, in the twenties. Anyway, so the two men. They went met. on a picnic. Oh, okay. And so he recollects going on this picnic, and they stopped somewhere and spread out a big blanket on on the grass and. Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, they, then the police arrived and uh, told them to move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is surreal. <laughs> this is... I it, imagine this. So this is one of his memories. I read that oh, okay. in a... I so, can't remember which book, but anyway, it was a, it was, it was a recollection of Christian mm -hmm. So he met him yes, yes. at picnic. I don't yes. know if afterwards they'd had any contact. I don't recollect I'm not my sure father about ever, that, no. ever talking about him or... Yeah. But anyway, you then went to a talk of Krishnamurti yes, we in, 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 in Switzerland in after my mother's death. Yeah, we went to, yes. to Salim. Mm -hmm. I went mm -hmm. to attended a talk. 
because I'd read quite a lot of yes. his books. Mm -hmm. and I was very taken by them, and they really spoke to me. I don't know if they had a, a, a totally positive effect on me because it, it um, you know, Tr Krishnamurti talked a lot about ambition, and uh, hmm, really, did you do you remember that in that way? Yes. Well, yes, in a way. Yes, in a way. He yes. said, uh, and he was rather against ambition, as, as well, I yes. interpreted. He, he, Me too. I, I would say, but he uh, he thought that ambition was was um, was not such a worthy. Uh, yes, that's right. A, a, a worthy uh, feeling mm -hmm. that um, you know why why be ambitious? Ambitious for what? Yes. Uh, he, so that he talked about more of. of that's what I mean, he would yourself. talk to you and you would take that in and it would in a way help you for later, yeah. for you. Yes, I yeah, mean, yeah. this was but probably is, very helpful to you. I was waiting for that because... You just needed confirmation <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> because I was not a very ambitious person and yes. it kind of uh, helped me uh, just to take life in a, in a very... Yes. Um, but it was not necessarily what I needed at the time, I think, looking back. Mm -hmm. but. Krishnamurti was an extraordinary person, and well, to hear him talk, yes. he was an extraordinary man of, of, of his age that still had that passion that mm -hmm. really, yes. I think I retained from it, that he was passionate. Instead of ambitious, he really was pushing people to, to be passionate about what they felt. Yes, that's right. And uh, not to just uh, look at things always uh, mm -hmm. without really feeling what it was. To, yes. to, um, to be passionate and serious, which were two words I think he used a lot. Yes. And uh, that stayed with me. And I think um, he, he was a beautiful man, he was an extraordinary man. It's fantastic the way you remember this, the way you say it. Because you say, well, looking back, maybe that's not what you need, but you then yourself in your work, talk about destiny versus circumstances and maybe we can get to the point now where you are studying about the background of your book because it takes you about eight or ten years like myself a decade to write mm. a book a serious book takes that kind of time so this is where Krishnamurti goes that's where you go into the serious subject to work for a decade on a book but before we go to this point, I just meant to ask you before I forget one thing. You, you have a farm, right? Still, or you had a farm with goats on it, a goat farm. Yes, in the, in the Lotte Garden. Yes. yes, because I said in my work to the my friends, clients, etc., that we're coming at an astrological moment now, where um, you know things are getting tense, etc. And I say to people, look, you need to create what I call a radiant zone a field of energy around you where you live a self-sustained life. My point is simply that you have been doing this for a long time already. Like, how long ago did you live this kind of life? Uh, this is a long time ago. After just, my father's death, we, we then... So moved, in the late 70s? In the late 70s. Yes. We moved down to the Tigawan. Yes. Onto a farm. And um, we... Yes, we tried to do that. So basically for, which, which for three decades, 25, 30 years, you've already been doing this? No, we lived there 14 years. Oh, we okay. Were, we were yes. farmers, officially farmers, you know, registered farmers. Oh, you were registered farmers? Yes, yeah, yeah. I find this absolutely Cause, phenomenal. Cause this is really uh, important. Because you needed to be in France, you needed some kind of official status. Oh, I see, yes, yes, of course. To, uh, and <laughs> so... Someone said, well, you've got land, uh, mm -hmm. be, be, a, be a farmer. And we Makes wanted sense, any yes. way to use the land and yes. just to try and be autonomous on... on That's what I call self-sufficient. Six hectares. Six hectares, hectare, hectare, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. So, so, yes, we became farmers, registered farmers. And we were not the most efficient farmers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have to learn, you know, this is what I say to my friends. Do you think you can just say I'm a farmer, you get to have to work on it? So um, maybe now we can talk about the book, mm, yes? yes? Shall we mm. go into this? So uh, if I can quickly say what I retain from it, 
to me, this is a thriller. It is a historical a page turner, 300 pages. You will not put this book down when you start. And it goes into a time that I myself am very, um, very um, interested in, have an affinity to it when I read the book. It's like I'm reliving this whole thing one more time. It's the story about, I'm just talking about the historical background briefly, that this is the 12th century, the time of the Casas, the Albigensian Crusade, mm. where the Pope and all these guys go after them and so on. And, and your characters just, I mean, it comes alive like you are with them there. There's something about your book, I'm not just saying that to flatter you, but there's something about this book that is totally um, what this in a way about, you know, mm. for, for me, from my viewpoint, but I know there's much, much more. So, what made you start about 10 years ago to want to write this book, A Fallen God? Uh, by the way, why is it called A Fallen God? Well, that was not the first title. The, the working title was, um, uh, I wanted to call it Mark and Isolde. Mark and Isolde, yes, of course. Because yes. The, there's been many novels, and, uh, and an opera, and mm -hmm. uh, of course, Tristan Wagner. and Isolde. Yes. Yes. But it's a triangle. The story is really, the story which to me is a myth, because it, it's something that's so universal mm -hmm. that you see even in, this, you know, in, in films today. Yes. Uh, La femme d'à côté, Truffaut. <laughs> yes. You know, the same story is told and retold and retold. Mm -hmm. But it started with uh, Tristan and Isolde. Yes. Which I think the first version was published in um, 1150 or by uh, Beroul. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the first written version I think we know of. Oh, yeah, and before Eschenbach? Before. Oh, yes, before them, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. They yes. came a bit later. Yes. Uh, oh, of course, they course. copied. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yes. Yes, I think, well, uh, mm. Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. says that. The greatest one is, uh, which I haven't read by the way, is by um, uh, Godfrey de Strasbourg. Yes, yeah. that's right, that's him. Yeah, yeah. I know. he says that's the, the, mm -hmm. the, the version. I didn't want to read that one because I wanted to stay with the, with the skeleton mm -hmm. and then tell it my way. Yes. Because it corresponds to very much something that happened in my own life and and oh, I see and I I really was looking for a way of writing about it mm -hmm. but I didn't want to write some kind of uh, he said I wish my great-grandfather uh, had written more operas like Tristan and Isol and, oh, uh, and those other ones with that heavy Germanic yes and, and uh, something more about love and Mm -hmm. And he said he wrote that one opera, but he, he didn't write enough of that. Mm -hmm. And it clicked in my mind. I thought, that's it, of course, Tristan Nizal. That's exactly the story I'm looking for. That made you, that got you started. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so that got me started. T tell us a little bit about the book. What is the book, A Fallen God? And again, why is it called A Fallen God? I mean, I mentioned it is set in the 12th century, the Casa time, but maybe you yes. can get into this. Well, then, when I began, I, I then placed it in the 12th century. Yes. Which is not... <clears throat> the actual story is... is uh, comes from an oral tradition mm -hmm. and it happens at an earlier time in, in history, in, in, in 900, the year 900. Oh, before. okay, it's a word of mouth. Okay, so, yeah, I understand. So, but the first novel was written in the 12th century. Yes, yes. And yes. at that time there were the troubadours. Yes, of course. There were uh, the, the Qatar heresy. A yes. lot was happening in, 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 mm -hmm. in the European world at yes, that time. Yes, yes. And uh, a way of seeing women through the troubadours was yes. changing. Mm -hmm. And the idea of romantic love was mm. supposed to be born at that moment. Yes. Because uh, for for the noble people, they never married out of love, they married out of convenience for... Well, it was deal-make, deals were made, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, play, I wanted to place it at that, at that period. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, I then 
started looking into uh, the Qatar heresy a bit more. Yes. I knew a little bit about it. Yes. Because we were living in, in, in Montségur. Yes. And, uh, uh, not the Montségur, but. N no, I know, but, but, but still, you were in. Three uh, villages, and it's one of the villages yes. that has a link. And very near to me, there's Pen d'Agenais. Oh, yes, okay, that's where the action is. Yes. By siege, by yes, Sinai yes. de Montfort. And that's very Yeah, you definitely live. I mean, your farm is in the area, in the general larger area where the whole yes. action was going on. It's, it's, because the, the whole, the, the, the Crusades were yes. a it giant place, operation. Yeah. Yes. That was the northernmost point yes, of yes, the yes. whole Qatar. Uh, and did you research some of it then, historically speaking? I mean, you so went I into researched, some... you know, I, researched, okay. I didn't want to write a historical novel. I understand, yes. I wanted to write a novel. Yes, it was your story. Yes. But so set in set a very in mysterious... Theory. Yes. For me, thrilling. Um, when I say thrilling, it's uh, there are plot twists. They are very interesting. There's this character who comes from the Orient. Mm. He's an astrologer, mm. and, and I found it. I mean, I was just like reading and reading, and it was it's um, it was like getting sucked into this old time. I felt almost like I knew some of these stories. Yes, well, I was, that's the way you you write because I mean. I know a little bit what it takes to write a book, and you are a really great writer. I mean, it's written in a, I don't know how to explain this well to the viewer, but it's well written. It's, it's done in a way that you care about it. You, as a reader, yes. you get into this and you really care about what's about to happen to these characters. Because actually, although you say write it from Mark's point of view, you actually go into everybody's point yes. of view, even the Pope's point of view. Yes. I found that description, by the way, phenomenal, where yes, your character the, the, goes to visit the Pope, the, the, the Pope yes. to, yeah, yeah. to help rescue. I don't know if we should say more about. Uh, we don't want to spoil of, the had plot. Had a lot of fun with, <laughs> yes. with, uh, with, um, with including Simon de Montfort. That that was grand. And that uh, was. Uh, that's the part where it gets really. I mean, there's violence in there, but it, it gets very strong. I mean, that's where mm. you are in it. That's that's not. It is not conceptual. It's not a history lesson. It gets very practical, whether a psychological chess game and this whole psychological warfare is going on between these yeah. two men. And so I found that absolutely. I mean, that's better than any John Le Carre novel. It's very hands-on. I mean, it's sort of. You feel oh, oh, no, something going to go wrong in this story. <laughs> something happened to me, yeah. really, which which is that writing. Of course, you start with a certain idea, and and you have a vague idea where you're going, and and but when you create characters, suddenly there there, there is a point, and I didn't know I didn't know about this, but I've since talked mm -hmm. to other writers, and and uh, and if if it really if the book really is meant to be then at some point the character, the novel, a novel, the characters have to take over. Yes, that's it. You can't, it's either gonna, you can't control them. Yes, and, uh, and like the French say, ça passe ou ça casse. It's wait. either really gonna happen or you can pull it away yes. and not pull it. But in your case, so they then it just takes you, off. You, you didn't think they would do because mm -hmm. it, they just do them. It comes yes. to you that they should do this, but it doesn't, it was not planned. Yes, yes, yes. Just through the characters, they suddenly take on a life of their own and that's, that's so very exciting. So it took you eight years to do that. Yeah. I find it's amazing. Yeah. That's really, that shows, Chris, you, you learned something from Krishna. <laughs> you really stayed with it. Yes, and, uh, yeah. Now, will this book, I have to say, the book, by the way, is available on Kindle now, A Fallen God, on Amazon. You can get it also on your website. We will show the website addresses and everything. But will you also have it published um, in a three-dimensional book sometime? Love to have it uh, because I think that's important. In, in, um, Personally, I would like to have a yeah. I would, a copy. I would love to do that, and, and um, there's already a publisher in Brazil that want, wants to. Um, oh, that's wants fantastic! To, wants to bring it out. Yes, and, and translations. I, I'm really very flattered because that's that. very good. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, but it's it's hard to find now a publisher in in in, um, in, in hardcover books because yes. uh, they're going through hard times. I think. They're not, uh, well, yeah, sure, they're but they're really there are ways you can and, and 
But I'll get there, I know I'll get there. I'm, I'm I can show you a way how to, I mean, we can talk about this later. You can, you can publish it yourself in both paperback and hardcover, if you want. There's an easy way to go about it. Oh, yeah. But if you have a publisher, that's fantastic news. Well, yes, yeah, yeah, that's um, very good news. <laughs> what is your next project? So we discussed um, the documentary f about your father's background. We talked about a book, the book, A Fallen God. W what's coming up next? You're working, well, of course, now on the further publication and well, bringing well, the book out. You asked me a question I didn't really answer, which was w why I called it a fallen god. Oh, yes. <coughs> I'm sorry. And uh, just very briefly... Um, no, I know the answer, I but began, you can't just say yes. <laughs> yes, you want... You want. No, no, you must... <laughs> I, I, um, I became very interested. What interested me most about the, the Qatar heresy yes. was... Um, their conception of the world we live in as being created by uh, a demiurge, or yes. a, 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 a false god. A uh, false god. A false god. Yes, yes. And this extended the, into the most extreme uh, Qatars, said it was the devil. Yes, exactly. Who was the same. Uh, who is the creator of, of the world in, in the Old Testament. Yes. They'd say this was the devil. Certain Gnostics had, had already had read a, a Yes, book. yes, yes. <coughs> and this interested me a lot. Um, and then I read uh, certain extracts about, uh, about Satan or Lucifer uh, mm -hmm. being uh, cast out. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and um, creating a world yes. uh, down here on mm -hmm. earth. And, and I thought, well, really, it's, this is our God. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the real God yes. up there yes. in, in the heavens, which the Qatars wanted to leave this world. They wanted to um, uh, deny everything that came from the flesh. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't need to meet yes. because it was the result of copulation. And, Copulation was just extending this whole masquerade of the world, that, uh, which was to them evil. Yes. And they wanted to to leave it and join the real God. Yes, yes, yes. In, in heaven, the, uh, they had a very radical away. outlook. Yes. But I thought I thought began to feel very strongly that um, the God we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Is this this devil? Yes. Who is here with us in the world? And perhaps we misunderstand him. Perhaps our rejection of of uh, of this uh, this creature, this false god, mm -hmm. is because in Christianity too, uh, nature is kind of rejected. Yes, that's right. There you go. And, right. and so it's not only the Qatars; they were only mm. going further. In, in, in this than the than the than the, Christ, than the Christianity I think Christianity always had that in it this yes, rejection of, that's of, right. uh, of sex of yes. the body of, of uh, and nature uh, everything of, of, yes. of nature mm -hmm. so I I just tried to to en envisage this fallen god mm -hmm. as uh, as something we have to contact. Yes. To, um, uh, and that you mean and then, that is in each one of us, really? Yes, each one of us, yes. and is projected especially into women, yes. because there is a rejection of women in, yes. in Christianity and, and in... Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the, the Qatars, I, I think they, they, they had a different uh, outlook on women. But, yes, but, that's uh, right. But certainly in Christianity, there's a, women are, are kind of associated with, uh, with the devil. With, mm. uh, from Adam and Eve already. Yes, yes. So, but you see what I found interesting, the way you narrate it at the end of your book. I, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, but I mean, if you have read uh, Lessing or Shikasta or The Syrian Experiments, really, I was reminded anyway of almost um, other forces that have come on this planet 
and created whatever is now left of it. To say it in another way, I see that what we see today on this world is the result of literary extraterrestrial wars gone wrong. But the narrative of it, that's a bit provocative, I guess, but the narrative in the Bible or in the teachings of Christianity, etc., is a somewhat falsified um, recounting of what really happened. But the way you say it in the book, um, I think it, it touches everybody and the reader yes. instantly figures out what you mean to say. Yes, yes. And one of my <coughs> sources of inspiration mm -hmm. is um, the, uh, the chapter in the, in the, Zo in the Zohar. Oh, yes, okay. Talk about that. It's called the, the Devouring Fire. Yes. And it talks about uh, the flame having, having uh, uh, an upper level, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a white flame. Yes. And then in that, if you look at the candle, there is a dark, there is a dark flame, yes. a black flame. Yes, yes. Or a, and uh, Moses, when he says, uh, he says to, uh, to the Jews, your God is a devouring fire. Mm-hmm. Um, he, as it explains in this chapter, he is, he, he is saying, you have to worship this God, even though he's a devouring fire. Because if you worship him, mm -hmm. then you will see that Israel is still alive today. <laughs> and it's amazing. Yeah, that's so how you... that came the idea of the fallen God. To yes. Say that if you yes. can't worship this fallen God who is here with us. Yes then we can never reach what is beyond because it is only through him that we can reach the flame above yes it doesn't devour us but we have to accept the flame that devours us and and somehow come to terms with him to, in order to reach up above it which seemed to be the message and i think this is where christianity that is beautifully said what you just said mm -hmm. is really well put Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really been an honor, a pleasure to do this. Thank you. Thank you. I meant to say something really interesting about um, my funny theory why your father was followed, but he was followed for a lot of reasons by the, you know, the powers that be. Mm. And, but I'll say my piece later about Krishnamurti, but you explained something that when your father was a very young man, 27 years old, that was like in 1916, during the First World War. Yes. What happened then? Well, he, he was called up by a, a group. Um, I haven't got the, this, this is well documented, but I haven't got the, um, <coughs> their names, they were kind of, the elderly, uh, prominent citizens who had set themselves up as, as overseers of the cultural, uh, the cultural atmosphere in, in, in America and what was being done. And, and, oh, I see. You know, keeping in, an in, eye Cal on, in California? Especially the c cinema industry, which was brand new. And well, I mean, your father popular. is the founder of <laughs> United Artists. Yes. Well, and so what were they doing? Well, they were like sort of um, after him or...? Well, they, they, called, they called him, they uh, summoned him to, uh, to a, a meeting That's and they told him that his, um, his work was uh, violent and vulgar and disruptive. <laughs> it's outrageous! <laughs> There's a projection that and, they were talking and, about uh, themselves. And that he had to um, tone it down, hmm. you know, because it was, uh, it was getting out of hand. So already, whoa, whoa, whoa. Very, at twenty-seven very in his uh, mm -hmm. in his career, mm -hmm. um, he was he was not appreciated. He was sort by, of singled by, out uh, and spotted as people who mm -hmm. wanted a certain, you know, bourgeois society uh, thought that he was in a way um, not a, not a po not a positive, healthy figure to have to be admired by so many people and. Yeah, so because your father was then already commanding already a large mentioned. following, yeah, and so they were actually trying to censor his work in a way. 
or that yes, was the beginning of yes, what we then later came. Yes, told them, and I suppose he had to, he had to uh, <coughs> please them with some mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. promises, and uh, he went on. But it was not necessarily that, at that point political, because he certainly wasn't directly political in his early films. Yes. He was just being funny. In the it way was more sociological. How, but yeah. it's true that he, it was a figure that tended to, um, the police were always after him. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he'd go into, he'd drift into uh, uh, elegant houses where people mm-hmm. were celebrating a wedding or something and mm-hmm. he'd create total chaos there. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was a disruptive kind of figure from very early on. You see, what, when you were speaking about um, the, the fact that really the MI5 and J. Edgar Hoover and all these crazies were trying to figure out the file of your father and he couldn't find any traces. That reminded me of a story that my publisher who studied uh, with Krishnamurti, she told me this, that actually Krishnamurti himself was followed, I don't know if you know this, by the CIA or FBI, I'm not sure, I think it was CIA. And anyway, make a long story short, because it's quite a story. The man who followed him, he was assigned, you know, to do his, uh, to cover him which is insane when you think about that. Anyway, this man, after a while, he, he began to understand who Krishnamurti is, or maybe didn't understand, but he knew he wasn't following a terrorist or something. Mm. And he approached Krishnamurti in total breach of his, I mean, gave up his cover, pretty much, mm. almost like Snowden-like, and he says, uh, what are you doing, Krishnamurti? Who are you? And so Krishnamurti actually engages the shadow of his, and tells him what's going on. So I think that they were probably covering everybody that came towards him as well. And that's when, I don't know exactly when that happened, but... So that's why the police would have appeared at that picnic, because in fact they were following Krishnamurti at the time. Oh, of they course, came. yes. But I don't know all the details, but I, I found amazing that our viewers know that we talk a lot about Krishnamurti in my work, etc. Anyway, but I find it amazing that here these two, I mean, legends meet <laughs> on a picnic. On a picnic. <laughs> I'm, I meant to say something else about your book to come back on the subject of a fallen god. I read the review by Peter Coyote on Amazon. Mm. Peter Coyote wrote a, an amazing review. Anyway, he says he he swallowed up your book like in a gulp, like I did, you know, it's an eight hour session, you just read and read and because you think, okay, I'll read that far and then, because you don't do chapters, you do this very much more elegantly than a formal chapter by chapter thing and you always feel like, okay, I'll stop here, but then when you reach that point, you think, no, no, I need to know now how this goes on. So, um, my idea was, I mean, I can see it on movie, on a screen. This is a story that I think should be, uh, a motion picture, a fallen god. I could imagine that. Mm-hmm. What oh, do you I, think? Yes, definitely. I suppose uh, um, <coughs> uh, director with uh, imagination mm-hmm. and, and uh, could could make it into a film. Uh, it could be maybe a European production, probably, yeah. Yeah. because it's a story that happens in the Casa around here, where we're meeting, by the way, in the. Mm-hmm. Pyrenees. Is there anything else, things that you would like to convey about your book or about your work? Because I think that your work is like a, an overarching, it's, it's a body of work. But you're going on now for the moment with your father's documentary while at the same time the efforts being made to publish your book. Yes, yeah, yes. Well, you know, it, it is a novel. And as you say, it's, uh, um, I wrote it to, to express certain things that I wanted to express, but also I've always tried to keep in mind that this must be entertaining, it mustn't be, yes. you know, it mustn't be boring, I suppose. I have that from, I come from a showbiz background. So maybe, <laughs> no, it's not boring for sure. In the back of what, my mind. what I found amazing, if I may say, is that how you can bring in very heavy subjects like esoteric or cult, I mean everything we're talking about, but bring it 
into what you're saying is not boring, it's a thriller. Mm. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> and so what's next? Well, I've got to finish this documentary. Yes, and, that's um, going to take still a while. Yeah, it will take, yes. it will, it will take uh, another year, I think, mm -hmm. to get it all together. And um, then, I'll, I suppose I'll start writing again. You're going it's back a, it's to writing. It's a big adventure, though, to start another book. Whew, tell me yes. about that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have eight years, you finish a book, you do a documentary, and a writer needs to write. Yeah. The story is. Yeah, yeah. Do you still live also in uh, Lot et Garonne, or you live in Switzerland mainly now? Well, we're really between the two. Oh, you share your time. Yes. yes. Though I think uh, at some point we'll have to settle into one place. Yes. But it's been a wonderful luxury to be able to um, spend winter in the snow in the mountains mm -hmm. and summer in, summer in autumn in, in, uh, in the Lot et Garonne. Yes which is a place I'm deeply attached to. But uh, yes, at some point we'll have to choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have explained we're coming into a time where it's a tense time. A lot of things are happening in the world economy. We'll touch upon that in other things that I will talk about. It's an astrologically tense time. We mm. talked about that mm. too, your Pisces, I'm a Pisces, and we're in a time now where with Neptune in Pisces, we're entering a completely different world. Well, what's up to now, a reality is going to fade. Mm. And then mm. something completely new mm. will happen by 2020 when the, a literal reset of society starts. Yeah. I, I think yeah. this is also where your work fits in. Yes, no, I feel that, definitely. We, our culture is slowly dying, which is, uh, I think, probably a natural thing. I mean, yes. it's sad, but it's, a, it's also a natural thing. Other, there's always something else that we don't, we don't see that's probably already here and already yes. moving in, but it, it's yes. hard to give it a shape or uh, know what it is. But I'm, I'm an optimist, I think, so, you know. Me too, as I see this is all going things to work out. Things must die for other things <coughs> to, yes. to move in. Okay.